Hopefully you can hear me over the din of baby chicks. They just followed me down here because I'm the food dispenser. <clears throat> Not that I have any food. So today let's talk about hide glue. How exciting. Um, this is going to be basically hide glue basics plus an overview of the process. I'll try to keep this simple and not get too geeky on you. So, uh, hide glue. A lot of our body is composed of collagen. Apparently quite a bit of it. If you were to strip everything else, there'd be like a whole bunch of collagen left. But for our purposes, let's keep this practical, there are certain tissues in the body which have very high concentrations of fairly pure collagen. And that makes those more useful to us because we can make glue out of them and leather. And those are generally the skin, which we already know. Tendons, tendons are sinews. They're the uh, connective cords that attach your muscles to your bones to, so that you can move. And another notable source is antler, which contains quite a bit and makes decent glue. So there are a few others. There's fish bladders. Um, there's probably some other stuff in a mammal that you can use, maybe the bladder. But those three are pretty good for us for now. Skin, antler, and sinews. Now sinews and antler are fairly Pure. You don't have to pre-treat them really at all. You could just, as long as the uh, sinews aren't contaminated with a lot of meat and fat and they're nice and clean, you can just go ahead and go straight to the boiling step with those. I'm not sure there would be any benefit to treating those in lime. Not only can you use the actual tendons, like if you're familiar with primitive tech stuff, then you probably are familiar with sinew, which is tendons shredded up that you can use to wrap arrowheads on and all kinds of, you know, for sewing thread and all kinds of different stuff like that. Not only can you use those pieces that you would normally use for that kind of thread type of uses, but you can also use the sheaths that encase the tendons, um, like in, for instance, in the lower leg of a deer. A lot of people think that you can use hooves for glue. Um, as far as I know, that is completely untrue. I have tried to boil hooves, other people have tried to boil hooves, they just don't make glue. And the reason is that they're more of a hair process. Um, they're like fingernails and uh, horns proper, like so the horns on a bull or a goat versus the antlers on a deer. So the antlers on a deer are an outgrowth of the skin more than they are an outgrowth of the hair, the same th system that produces hair. Whereas horn, and um, hooves are both made of keratin, and those are and are more related to the hair stuff. And we're going to talk about those different proteins in a minute. Anyway, when people say that, that they talk about hoof glue, what they're actually talking about is when you butcher an animal, the very lower section of the leg, it's, it's called the, well, the bone in there is called the cannon bone. And from here all the way up that whole section of leg and the foot, there just isn't really a lot of anything edible in there. But there is a lot of connective tissue and a lot of um, sinews and tendon sheaths and collagen, basically. Lots of collagen. So glue boilers would get these lower legs, um, which no one else really wanted. I've tried to cook them before and it's just, they don't really make that good a stock um, even. And they would cook those, extract the oil off the top, which they sold as Neat's Foot Oil. Here, here I am getting all geeky. Okay, I'm going to try to cut this short. <laughs> the oil is Neat's Foot Oil, and that's used to dress leather and in tanning. <clears throat> and then the solution would turn into a glue solution. So that's where that comes from. Um, but the actual hoof itself does not dissolve into glue. That's made out of keratin. As far as I know, you can't make glue out of those at all. You can also use bones um, to make glue. And I, I'm I'm not entirely sure what the difference in the proteins are, but I think bones are chondroitin, maybe. Um, I need to bone up on that, ha ha ha. But basically, my impression is that bone glue is, is less accessible to home producers. I'd like to try it someday, but not that interested because it's easier to make skin glue, and my impression is that skin glue is better, and the reason that people made bone glue was just from a shortage of skin basically, or other, you know, skin, whatever else you're going to make a uh, regular hide glue out of. 
Um, it may have certain uses in the arts, I'm not really sure, but whatever. So let's, um, let's talk about skin structure for a minute. So most of you are gonna end up using skin to make glue. It's fairly accessible. If you're already tanning hides, you often end up with extra tag ends. You could cut those off in the beginning of the, the tanning process, just planning ahead and dry them and process them later for glue. So let's take a look at skin. Okay, that's just too bad. I could do better than that. Let's take a look at skin. This is skin. Inside here, there's a dense network of fibers. These fibers, you could think of them like felt, or if you cut up in a piece of leather and look at it, it kind of looks like felt, and you can actually see these fibers. So these are collagen fibers. This is what we're after, is the collagen. And it's also what's used in tanning. If you tan a piece of skin, this is what you want left when you're done tanning, is you want this collagen. So, this is what we want. We want this collagen is relatively pure. Okay. But there are other things in here. There's a layer here we call the epidermis. This is composed of keratin, like hooves and horns. Not antlers, horns. These are hair follicles. There's hairs in here. At the bottom is the follicle, the little thing that grows the hair. There are little muscles in here that attach to the hairs and when these contract or whatever they do, it makes the hairs stand up and that's what gives you goosebumps. There's also, let's say there's some sebaceous glands, I don't know where those are, but they produce oil and dump it onto the surface of your skin um, so that the skin is lubricated. And we don't really want that either. Then there's just fat. So there's globules of fat here and there, but there's a lot more down in this direction. And maybe by the time we get to the bottom, there's actually sheets of fat. And then there's some meat, let's say, pieces of meat. And this is more collagen, but it's real big, loose, coarse fibers, say. Not, not as many fibers and very loosely arranged and very contaminated with fat. There's a baby, baby chick here. No, I couldn't catch him. Anyway, so we wanted just this, but we got all this. So, when you soak the skin in lime, this layer here, this green layer, the epidermis, is a very thin layer of cells, but it's fairly impervious to outside elements, uh, say if you spill something on your skin. But one it's not impervious to is highly alkaline solutions like lime solution. So we add lime to this and this stuff breaks down. It just kind of dissolves and falls apart and this whole layer will just slough off and when we rinse the skin and dehair it, not only will the hair come out because the lime has destroyed it, the roots down here, but all this, a lot of this junk here that made up all this stuff will wash out of the skin. So really the purpose of liming here in making high glue is to get rid of as much of this stuff as possible, like say the fats, turn into insoluble soaps when they combine with the lime and can be, some of them can be washed out of the skin. Um, the muscle tissue is somewhat destroyed by that. There's other stuff in here too. I'm not gonna get too technical here, but, or too geeky, I guess. But let's just say all we want is this. So once we've limed the skin and repeatedly rinsed it and scraped over it to like push this junk out of the skin, Ideally, this is never possible, you know, completely. This is just an ideal. We're left with this nice, clean network fiber that we could either turn into leather by tanning it with the oak bark or something like that, or we can cook it into glue. All right, so how does this work? This is the process. This is the basic process here. 
Once the skin has been limed and we, I have rinsed and pushed out by, by mechanically scraping it over and over again, as much of the lime as I can get out, I'm going to dry pieces of the skin. <clears throat> and when I dry the skin, the once caustic lime in there, calcium hydroxide, is turned into limestone, basically, um, calcium carbonate. And that's inert. So, you know, if I took a handful of, of uh, lime putty that, you know, the stuff that basically I process the skin in and throw that in my batch of glue, that's going to screw stuff up, right? But once it's dry, it's going to turn into calcium carbonate. So, like, that would be like a seashell. So, I, I threw some seashells in my lime cooking vat. It probably wouldn't do anything. So, what we're doing there is we're when we dry the skin and turn the, any remaining lime we couldn't get out to calcium carbonate, we're making it just inert, basically. It's just some little bits of dust in there. So then, we throw that in a pot. So these are my pieces of skin in there. And I want to just cover these with water, all right? So that when the solution is finished cooking, it's nice and strong, and I don't have, like, if I filled it up to here, I'd have to cook all this water off to get a good, strong solution. So just enough water to cover. Cook it. Low and slow. Once it's cooked enough, this stuff is actually going to dissolve. Like, most of the skin will be gone. It'll be dissolved in water as a glue solution. Once that's done, <clears throat> We're going to pour off the glue and, you know, filter it probably into sheets. Let it cool. And when it cools, it gels, just like Jello, because it's the same thing. And when it's cool and thick enough to handle, or uh, firm enough to handle, it'll get cut up into little tiny bits, dried, and then that's your finished high glue. The glue needs to be soaked in water, brought up to heat, and then it can be used. So, let's talk now. I'm gonna back up a minute here. And let's talk about high glue in general. So high glue was the staple glue for a very long time. Some of its properties could be considered detriments and some of them could be considered benefits or both at, at different times. Um, it is very strong. That's generally just a good thing. It is water soluble. Now what I mean by that is we already know that we made the glue by cooking it in water and bring it into solution. But if it gets wet again, it will go back into solution. Or first it will, like, let's say we glue a piece of furniture together and then we leave it out in the rain. When it gets to a certain moisture content, excuse me, I have to turn off this hose. Say it's sitting out, your furniture is sitting out in the rain. When it reaches a certain moisture content, the glue, the dry glue will turn back into a gel and your joint will, you know, fall apart. The glue will no longer be doing its work. All right, so that's bad, but that's good. So let's say that you make, you have a violin that was made 200 years ago with hide glue. It's probably been repaired numerous times, um, literally taken completely apart and glued back together. Now, if you had a glue that was not water soluble, you couldn't do that. So in that case, it's a benefit. This is a violin, by the way. <laughs> working time. Let's talk about working time. <clears throat> working time with high glue is very short, extremely short. When the glue is hot, it's liquid, it's liquid, but as soon as it cools, it turns into a gel. In the gel state, you can't work with it. You know, you can't put gel on one piece of wood and then put it on another piece of wood. Yeah, let it turn into a gel, stick it together and get a strong joint. You need to put hot, 
hot liquid glue on both surfaces, get them together, get them clamped, and not move it, you know, before the gel, gelling phase. So that's a problem. Working time is short. However, there are still places to use it. It has all kinds of cool uses in the primitive arts. It still has uses in fine arts. It still has uses in furniture making, instrument making, wherever you want to take the thing back apart. I think it's, argue, it's been argued that um, in terms of the acoustic qualities or you know the, the resonant qualities that it's a superior glue to a lot of the modern glues for making instruments. So there's a place for it and what's really cool about it I think is just that you can make it at home and make this uh, very strong, very functional glue with just stuff that you might not use for anything else. If you're a person that does your own butchering and slaughtering, you're always going to end up with uh, parts. If you're a tanner, you'll end up with parts. And it's just a good thing to know and a good thing to know about. So let's just leave it at that. I think I kept that as short as I could stand and uh, get back to work on this hide, which I think I'm just going to soak and I'll see you in a day or two when it's time to start deherring and fleshing. Really refleshing, actually.